With that, I wanted to um, introduce Dr. Golden. Um, so Dr. Matt Golden is a professor of medicine and allergy and infectious disease at, and epidemiology at the University of Washington. He's director of the Public Health Seattle King County HIV and STD program and the director of the UW Center for, for uh, AIDS and STD. Dr. Golden's research seeks to integrate public health practice with operational research in the area of HIV STD prevention. And as director of the UW Center for AIDS and STD, he's been um, instrumental in, in um, getting this course uh, where it is now. So we're delighted to have him do uh, our, our introductory lecture today. So uh, you can feel free to take it away, Matt. Well, welcome to everybody. It's very exciting to have you all here. I wanna uh, thank Renee and Christine for all of their hard work in putting this course together. I'm just gonna briefly talk about what I think are some of the important challenges in HIV. And uh, what I'll do initially is talk about the scale of the HIV STI problem, both globally and in the United States, and then go over what I think are some of the specific challenges and opportunities related to different pathogens. This slide is showing you the global scale of STIs as a health problem, data from the Institute from Health Metrics. Uh, we're looking here at the number of disability adjusted life years lost associated with each of the different or some of the different. You can see a few things stand out. The first is that, of course, uh, the DALI impact internationally is dominated by HIV infection, uh, with the next largest proportion really coming from HPV associated malignancies. And here I've included uh, both cervical and oral cancers. Uh, the other STIs, though, of course, make a very large contribution as well. At its peak for the HIV epidemic, 5% of the total burden of disease in the world was related to HIV and STIs. And this doesn't even include the impact of infertility, which is a major cause of morbidity around the world. Now, I would point out that the impact of HIV infection has declined roughly 45% since its peak in 2000. Huge public health triumph, I would say. Obviously not a complete victory, and we have a long way to go, uh, but definitely a major step forward. The influence of sexually transmitted infections around the world varies dramatically. In 2017, roughly 3% of all DALIs were attributable uh, to HIV STIs. Here, I have not included uh, oral cancers. Uh, but it, you can see the, the difference between a country like the United States where less than 1% of all morbidity is really attributable to HIV and STIs. It's just dramatically different than a country like Mozambique, where it's a quarter of all the DALIs in the country. Uh, and I just chose Mozambique because I work in Mozambique and I care about Mozambique, but it is, I think, a dramatic example of how important an impact STIs can have. These data come from the United States. They're in some ways a little old. Uh, the last time CDC made an effort to estimate the economic impact of uh, HIV and STIs in the United States was 2008. These are, are numbers which are upward to 2019 dollars. And again, you can see the dominance of HIV and HPV. Although really uh, a lot of STIs are contributing to morbidity, we're talking about over $20 billion a year in economic impact in the United States scale, again, of the problem is really dramatic. One of the major challenges, it seems to me, is the funding. What you're looking at here is total funding for HIV-related work in low- and middle-income countries around the world. A, a few things, you know, really stand out to me. As I said, we, we have made dramatic progress. But the global demand for resources keeps growing, and the funding does not. The funding is essentially flat. And COVID-19 is going to create new demands on this funding. At present, 57% of all funding for HIV-related work in low- and middle-income countries comes from the domestic public and private sources themselves. The second largest source of funding is the United States government, primarily through the PEPFAR program, which contributes 26% of all funding internationally in low- and middle-income countries. And I, I, I can't help but feel is can we continue to make progress without additional resources? And even though there's been this shift from to, lo to local government 
taking on a greater proportion of that burden, who will be left behind in that system? Which countries will not be able to pick up the burden? Certainly some countries have. Vietnam is a great example of a country that has. South Africa has done a great deal. Some countries are going to struggle. The problem of funding is also extremely dramatic in the United States. As many of you who uh, live in the United States may know, we have this new End the HIV Epidemic Initiative. I think we are all grateful for the new money, which is uh, flowing through this. This is $266 million of new funding in 2019. However, what you're looking at at this slide is what is the cost of antiretroviral in terms of wholesale prices in the United States. Between 2012 and 2018, these prices went up 34%, which is three and a half times the rate of inflation. In order for, uh, we currently spend $22 billion a year on antiretroviral therapy in the United States. If we want to increase viral suppression to 90% from the current estimate of what suppression is, we will need $35.6 billion in new funding to buy these medications. Where is that going to come from? And won't that simply consume all of the $266 million and very much more for the End Epidemic Initiative? And given the rate of increase in the cost of these medications, we won't even keep up. So something has to be done to manage the cost of the meds. In terms of major opportunities, I think one of the major opportunities is really differentiated. So behavior change is really hard. And typically, counseling interventions have small and non-durable effects. Changing the larger environment to address the major socioeconomic determinants of health is desirable, but very hard for us to do at the programmatic level of public health. Uh, so we all believe it's important to eliminate poverty and racism. But as someone who runs an HIV STD control program, it's beyond the impact of the program itself to fundamentally change these aspects of the society. I think where we really want to go is focus on changing our healthcare system and not on changing our patients, because changing the patients is probably not achievable in most instances. Differentiated care is a model to do that. And the idea here is that we change, modify the service intensity and the components of service the frequency with which patients are receiving care, where they receive the care, and who is providing the care to accommodate the reality of the patient's lives and ensure that different people get different types of care that meets their needs and which is efficient to the healthcare system itself. I really like this study. Uh, this was a relative utility study that was undertaken related to HIV clinical attributes in the discrete choice experiment in Zambia. So what the the investigators did is they looked at Zambian patients who had been lost to follow They presented them a series of choices about how might their care be reorganized to better serve them. Um, and what, and they were given these different options. So you can see when you look at the clinical attributes at the top, how much extra wait time would you be willing to have if to have the clinic a kilometer closer to your house? So 0.3 hours is what they said, per kilometer. How about if I could receive three months of antiretrovirals instead of one? They'd be willing to wait an additional 20 hours to be seen. How about if I could receive five months instead of three, another 10? How about if the people were just nice to me instead of being rude, the staff? Almost 20 extra hours of wait time. And in terms of looking at traveling, again, we look at these same things. The things that are dominant are receiving more meds, so not having to come back to the clinic every month, and being well-treated, 44 extra kilometers. You would be willing to travel an extra 44 kilometers to receive your care from someone who was nice as opposed to someone who was rude. Now, this is a discrete choice experiment, but I think it really highlights the attributes of the clinic as a critical element of why people are successful in receiving care. We have seen a similar sort of thing in Seattle where we developed something called Max Clinic. Christine mentioned this before. There's an opportunity to look at a video about our Max Clinic. This is what's called a low barrier care clinic where people have not received achieved viral suppression in Seattle. And the key attributes of the clinic is that all the care is provided on a walk-in basis. And in the United States, 
typically people have to make an appointment to be seen. Patients receive incentives, so they get $25 for a blood draw, they get $50 if they're suppressed, uh, they get a voucher for food up to once a week to go to our cafeteria. And their relationships with our team, which is an interdisciplinary team. What this enrollment in the clinic did, and this is in a very tough to treat population, overwhelmingly the patients have unstable housing, uh, almost everybody is using substances, many have major mental illness was a three-fold increase in viral suppression relative to baseline um, in a control analysis. So I think, again, emphasizing if we alter the organization of care, we can potentially make I think another major innovation to think about is long after uh, The slide here is showing you the results of the FLARE study, which was a randomized controlled trial of delivery versus continuation of the same oral regimen uh, this, what you see here is that this was equivalency study, so it appeared that this seemed to work well. What we have at present is an ongoing randomized controlled trial evaluating the role in suboptimally adherent adults. So the first study just shows us that these meds work. I think the big issue is going to be, does giving people a long-acting agent improve viral suppression in people who are really struggling uh, to do that? And will a monthly injection really be easier for these patients? I, I don't think it's clear uh, whether this is going to work and who it will help. But I do think that the technical innovation is typically the greatest source of opportunity in science, and that this is a major potential innovation. Let's switch now and talk briefly about HPV. Uh, the challenge in low and middle income uh, countries is enormous. There are over a quarter million deaths in 2017 related to HPV infection. One in 65 women will develop cervical cancer. Uh, cervical cancer is the most common cause of cancer across the world. You can see that looking at age standardized mortality is very unequally distributed with overwhelming burden of disease being in sub-Saharan Africa, but also high levels of disease elsewhere in the world, particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, you can see very high burden of disease, for example, in Bolivia. here is that we have really, really good interventions. On the left hand of the slide, you're looking at data from Denmark, look, comparing HPV prevalence in the era before and after HPV vaccination in Denmark. The data successful in rolling out their program. What you can appreciate, if you look at the middle bar of slides, the HPV 16 and 18, here these, the, what they're looking at is the impact of the earlier vaccines, which were just almost the elimination of HPV prevalence in the vaccination period uh, uh, in Denmark with no impact or vir virtually no impact on the other HPV types. So they are seeing that population level effect. There are other evidence of the population level effect as well. I think the other thing that we really see is that HPV DNA testing is a good intervention. And in a huge cluster randomized control trial undertaken in India, what you see is a 50% reduction in cervical cancer mortality with a single round of HPV DNA testing in women. Unfortunately, we are not bringing these interventions to scale or certainly not bringing them to scale in the way we need to. Look at these different components of the programs on this slide comparing high, low, income, low middle income, which is in gray in the, in the low-income countries. In countries with HPV vaccine, you can see pretty high in the high-income countries, but in low-income countries, we're looking at under 30% have incorporated HPV as of March 2020. The same sort of pattern with cervical cancer screening programs, very modest uptake in lower-income countries. And then in terms of cancer management, again, a very unequal distribution of the available resources. The World Health Organization has developed a draft document on cervical cancer elimination. And the goal is to decrease incidence to less than four per 100,000. The limits of the goal by 2030 is 90% vaccination, 70% screening with high performance tests, and again at 45, and 90% of women can be treated. To realize these goals, we're going to need very substantial changes in our infrastructure. And I think for all of you who are working in low and middle income countries, 
the research questions are going to be what are the best investments in different environments and how do we bring these interventions to scale? This is a major opportunity, it seems to me, in the implementation of science, but also a big challenge. The one thing I would point out in this document, and maybe I just missed it, is there is no focus on male circumcision in this plan, which to me really is a major missed opportunity. Uh, this is a very effective intervention for HPV. It's a very effective intervention for HIV infection and really needs to be part of the core component of a cervical cancer elimination plan around the world. I regret to say that the United States is also not doing as well on HPV immunization as we need to do. On the left hand of the side, you're looking at the percentage of American adults 18 to 26 who have received the number of doses that they're supposed to have received. And it's really only a little over 20% of 2018. There's a lot of variance depending on where you live in the United States. Poor distribution of the benefits mirrors what you would see with HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases, with generally better numbers coming from the coasts uh, and some parts of the Midwest, and generally poor performance uh, in much of the South. But I would point out that Louisiana, which is also a Medicaid expansion state, uh, is doing pretty well. So it is not a universal problem, and that would be true of North Carolina as well in the South, which would suggest to me that it is feasible to make progress in diverse environments in the United States. How we move forward, I'd say this is an open area of interest. This, these data come from a meta-analysis uh, looking at HPV interventions to improve uh, HPV uh, vaccine uptake. I would say a lot of interventions showing some effect. Uh, the most commonly studied, studied is reminder and recall systems. Uh, none of them, I would say, are home runs. Uh, many are not consistently effective. What we need to be thinking about is combination interventions and a focus on scalability and bringing these uh, to bear. I would also say that we face a major challenge in the United States in terms of the anti-vaccine movement which uh, is frequently uh, includes a, a certain conspiratorial element to it. This needs a more aggressive response in the United States, particularly in the COVID era, if we're going to deploy a COVID vaccine uh, when we act. Another challenge is sexually transmitted infections in men who have sex with men. On this slide, you're looking at the excess rate of primary and secondary syphilis in men versus women in the United States. In other words, if we subtract the incidence in women from men, assuming that we would have a roughly one-to-one -one ratio, this is the excess you see in men, which is one measure of trying to estimate how What you can appreciate is this ratio uh, was very high in the immediate period after the Second World War declined dramatically, began to climb in the late 50s, peaked right before the HIV epidemic or right as the HIV epidemic hit, plummeted, and has been rising substantially since the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, with the advent of antiretroviral therapy. At present, roughly 9% of men on PrEP will be diagnosed with syphilis every year. The rates of other bacterial STIs are also rising. We are seeing increasing rates of syphilis in women and children. And overall, the pattern is one of HIV STI epidemiologic uncoupling, where we're seeing declining rates of HIV in men who have sex with men in many parts of the United States, even as the rates of other sexually transmitted infections. I think that we do have some opportunities. So in the US, the new federal and the epidemic funds can be used to build infrastructure that integrates HIV and STD control activity. So that would include things like STD clinics that provide PrEP and integrating PrEP into partner services. There's an opportunity really related to this. I'm gonna just show you some data from King County. These were data from our health department where we have integrated trying to link people to PrEP to partner services, which is to say when you're diagnosed with syphilis, or gonorrhea and our staff contact you to ensure your partners are treated. We also try to offer you PrEP. So during this time period, we contacted 6,400 HIV negative men who have sex with men. We had data on 89% of these men. 43% of the men were already on PrEP and this really increased dramatically between 2014 and 2019. So we went from 9 
men with bacterial STI. On PrEP to 61%, very high level of PrEP use in men on STIs. Among the 57% of men who were not already on PrEP, potentially eligible, we offered a little over half of them PrEP. And part of that reflected the fact that this program that evolved over time, we would offer everybody PrEP. At this point, early on, we didn't have capacity to do that, so we were more specific. Of them, 67% accepted referral, over half of them initiated PrEP. So, I think this is quite a successful way of integrating PrEP uh, promotion. What's hard for me to say is, does integrating STI control measures, uh, does it affect between uh, STI and HIV, does it reverse STI trends? So can we really affect those STI? And that's tough. We have a few interventions that are perhaps promising. We have doxycycline for STI prep for men with syphilis. It looks to be roughly 70% effective in reducing syphilis and chlamydia. I think the issue is, is it safe enough? Uh, could we have more sensitive diagnostics that close the window period from infection to diagnosis? The window period when a person is infected with syphilis to when they are antibody positive is probably in the neighborhood of three to six weeks in precisely known. If we could identify those people earlier in their infection, would we bring the infection rates down? And then can we change the population's behavior? And if so, how? Uh, this has really been tough. The population changes its behavior, but it's not clear that we change the population's behavior as public health people. I think the population does this mostly on its own. Antimicrobial resistant gonorrhea is a major problem. So we have rising rates of resistance with very limited alternatives in our development. As this is shown here, you can see over the trends over time in resistance. Uh, most recently, we've seen a big bump in azithromycin resistance in the United States to gonorrhea. Azithromycin has long been, or for many years now, has been part of our uh, standard. So we need strategies to sustain the reservoir of antimicrobial susceptibility, public health activities to control gonorrhea more generally, and really technical innovation. So we need new drugs, we need new diagnostics, and ideally we need a vaccine. I think the role of screening for bacterial STIs in high income nations is a major controversy. Some of you may not have considered uh, this so much because these screening programs uh, exist. Uh, in many countries. They exist in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, and Australia. But over the years, there has been a growing concern that chlamydia screening may not be a good intervention. It may not be a cost-effective intervention. Some of this reflects uncertainty about the natural history of infection, the timing and frequency of sequelae. What happens with chlamydia in terms of when you get infected, when you develop PID, and when you develop tubal factor infertility? We have individual level randomized trials that show an impact on public inflammatory disease. But it's not clear that we've ever really had an impact on chlamydial prevalence. We don't see it in surveillance data. We don't see it in cluster randomized trials. But I would point out that the, none of the cluster randomized trials have actually had a major impact on chlamydial screening. So we can't even look at the intermediate outcome very successfully. So I'm not sure those trials have been terribly informative. What we're left with is this dilemma. Do we sustain these screening programs? Do we increase them or do we cut back and move away from this intervention? And more broadly, I think it raises the issue of what is our evidentiary standard? Do we really need to know population level impact? Uh, we want to measure the impact of an intervention designed to prevent sequelae, but that sequelae occurs often years after the intervention and we have no surveillance system to do it. So compounding all of that is that it's not clear to me that the cost effectiveness estimates are credible because how do you even decide how you're gonna value infertility versus death? The two outcomes are so dissimilar that they don't lend themselves to a very uh, precise estimate. Screening also represents a challenge in low and middle income countries. So for many years, we have relied on syndromic uh, treatment in most low and middle income countries. This works probably okay for urethral discharge and ulcer disease. 
not perfect. But it's never worked terribly well for vaginal discharge. So at the top, what you're looking at is the WHO flow charts and what are the sensitivity and specificity. So if we just do risk assessment, it's 28% sensitive and 57% specific. If we add a speculum exam, our sensitivity goes to 45%. Our specificity gets a little better to 74%. If we do a wet mount in a gram stain, which is frequently not available in most environments, sensitivity uh, increases, specificity actually declines. There are, it has been a study looking at selective use of point of care, sort of point of care molecular diagnostics uh, using gene expert, which uh, is not, has not proven to be terribly scalable. It does appear to have some benefit. And it seems to me the big question is, are we going to invest in gonorrhea and chlamydia control in low income, middle income countries? And what interventions make sense under what circumstances? Where does this fit in the overall pattern of investment? What we really need is lower cost, better point of care tests. Uh, but these are not widely available at present. We do have point of care tests for syphilis. And finally, the elephant in the room is COVID-19. Over, at this point, over 14 and a half million confirmed cases around the world. We have over 600,000 deaths, uh, which is really astounding when you think infectious disease, which we didn't even identify. It threatens a major, potentially long-term disruption in HIV ST services. That certainly has been associated with social distancing, diminished government revenue uh, as uh, the economy uh, suffer and really revise priorities for both our funding and our staff to focus on COVID-19, but to the detriment of HIV STD. And the question is, how can we sustain our core services and build capacity across healthcare systems? So in conclusion, I would say that the global burden of HIV STA remains enormous. There are a lot of opportunities to make things better. We have a profound need for research along the full continuum to implementation and where the greatest opportunities reside varies depending on the problem and the available tools. In general, scientific innovation is the largest driver of dramatic change. Examples of this include antiretroviral therapy for, anti for HIV and HPV immunization. But there are many opportunities for integrated public health practice and research. And we really need to focus on structural changes particularly how do we deliver healthcare to make it work most efficiently and for the largest number of people. With that, I would just say that I'm very glad that you are all here and I welcome you to the course uh, and I hope you have a great couple of weeks and learn a ton and it really makes a difference uh, for the people where you live and for the health of your community.